I'm proud to present Simon Sakai. Uh, he's an SBS alum uh, and working on his very interesting startup, which I hope you get to hear more about either at the, his presentation or at drinks today, followed by uh, the famous Phil Newman uh, to talk more about longevity as a topic, as a theme, and the intersection of investments, uh, healthcare, policy, as well as entrepreneurship in that same space. Without further ado, let's welcome uh, Simon. You guys hear me? Yeah. Hey, um, super excited to be here. Uh, I was a student at the business school myself. I got involved in longevity through this society, through an event like this. I wasn't in longevity before. Um, and when uh, the talk started, the person who was giving the presentation said, if you're interested, please get in touch with me. We need more good people in the space. Um, reach out to me on LinkedIn, and that's exactly what I did, and here I am today. Now, I'm working in the space. I'm the co-president of the Optus Society of Aging and Longevity. It's an unbelievable space, so if any of you are interested in what we have to say, please reach out to me. Um, we need great people in the space, and obviously, joining society, uh, we do lots of great events like this. So, <clears throat> um, we have a smaller room before, which is more interactive, but I'll try to kind of keep the same idea. Uh, I want to start by asking you guys a question. Um, so who wants to live forever? Raise your hand. Okay. We've got a couple, right? Who, who does not want to live forever? Raise your hand. Okay. I want you to remember. No, no, no. Keep your hands raised. We'll come back to you. Um, I want you to remember who you guys are. Um, so I'm going to ask you some more questions. You can put your hand back down. Uh, who wants to live 50 years longer? Raise your hand. Okay. So a lot more people want to live 50 years longer. Um, who wants to live 10 years longer? A lot more people, yeah. Similar to Okay. Now the people who the people who did not want to live forever, raise your hand again. Can can, can one of you volunteer to tell me why you wouldn't want to live forever? Over here? It depends on how you live forever. It depends on how you live forever? What do you mean by that? As in, am I unable to move at some point? Can I do everything? Like, is my life normal? Right, yeah. Is your life it is, normal? Yes, maybe. But it's not what's the point. What's the point with your immobile? Or not just immobile. If you have impaired. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Like, why would you want to live forever? Like not. Great point. Why would you want to live longer if you're going to be unhealthy? Uh, anyone else who said they didn't want to live forever um, have a reason why they don't want to live forever? Over there? Everyone else dies. Everyone else dies. Okay. Fair point. Good point. Uh, in the back over there? Who's sure? You wouldn't be in a rush to get in bed. Okay. Uh, are you yet? <clears throat> okay. Now, um, for all the people who said they, they, they didn't want to live forever, I have another, I have a little thought experiment for you. Let's say when you were born, you were diagnosed with Romanski's disease. Now, Romanski's disease is, is, is chronic. It will kill you at the end. Um, and it gradually takes away your life functions um, sometimes your ability to walk, to see, um, causes incontinence. I mean, it's really awful. Um, and let's say you're in your 70s, your 80s, and this romance disease has really, really accelerated to the point where you're on your deathbed. And someone, and, and I want you to really think about it. You're on your deathbed, you have romance disease, not cancer, not diabetes, but romance disease. And someone says, We have this treatment that can stop this romance disease from. Would you take this treatment? So raise your hand if you didn't want to live forever. Now keep your hand raised if you would take this treatment. Okay, great. So 
a lot of you kept your hands raised. So there is no such thing as Romanski's disease. What I described to you are the symptoms of aging. And uh, we tend not to think of aging as a disease, which is fair. It's an inevitability. Um, what is it? And that's kind of what longevity is about. Uh, and I think a lot of people, when they think about the longevity space, they have these wild statements like, do you want to live forever? Is this ethical? Is this right? Should we allow people to live forever? But the truth is, is that if you were sick, something, you'd want to get treatment, the treatment is there. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, I think a lot of people, um, when they talk about longevity, some of you may be more familiar with it, they're waiting for some breakthrough drug or a gene therapy or something that's going to add 50 years to your life. And they're like, oh, when is this actually going to happen? Um, I, I believe that it's already here. And what's here right now is a mindset. And the way that I see it is I'm going to go through some of these things to explain to you some terms. Um, we had the discovery of the scientific method hundreds of years ago. It was a mindset that allowed us to look at data and information in a way that allowed us to do something tangible. And these things that I'm going to go through right here are part of a longevity mindset. It's a way of seeing yourself, the world, health, and medicine that may not be a discovery in itself. I mean, some of them are, but are tra as transformational as the, uh, the scientific method. So, um, let's start with the hallmarks of aging. So longevity is not anti-aging as you know it. It's not like face screens. Um, it, is a, it is a clinical approach to looking at the underlying causes of aging. Um, and what, what, what they're typically called are the hallmarks. Uh, they were initially nine, they moved to 10, now there's 12 um, recently. And these are the, the true drivers of aging on a molecular, cellular level. So that's super exciting stuff. The fact that we're even looking at the processes and we've mapped them out, that is a huge discovery in itself. Uh, now I want to move over to you guys. Lifespan versus health span. Can someone explain to me the difference between lifespan and health span? Because I know we've got some experts in the crowd, so I want to I want to leverage you guys. Lifespan versus health span? Over here? Um, lifespan is the longevity, the length of your life. Yeah. That includes the time during which you have chronic diseases and other ill health. Lifespan is the length of healthy life that you have. Beautiful, beautiful. So lifespan is how long you're alive. Health span is the amount of time you're healthy. This is another amazing distinction to make because I think previously we were really just looking at how long are you alive, but now we're thinking of how long are you healthy versus how long you're alive. And what's beautiful about longevity is that it splits these two up and tries to expand the time you are healthy while alive, not just a long your life. Right, next, biological age versus numerical age. Uh, can someone help me out here? Over there. I mean, not a professional, but I think the thing is that if you are healthy at a certain age, like you could be 30, your body could be biologically 42 if you're not, like say if you're eating pizza every night and drinking whatever well, pint of beer, but you could be 45 and your biological age could be 30 if you are very healthy and go to the gym five times a week or whatever. Beautiful, this is an unbelievable idea. The fact that your body's age can be separate to your numerical age. That the fact that these two are separate are, again, a revolution in the way of seeing ourselves. You ask me how old I am? Well, if you ask me how old I am, A, I'm not going to tell you. But um, B, it doesn't matter because it's just a number. What truly matters is how old your tissue is, how much your body has deteriorated. And the fact that we can see those two things are separate is a huge breakthrough. Um, next thing I'm going to say. Biological aging is flexible. Um, what we've kind of seen is that you can age physically faster or slower. Now, we can't go around the sun faster. We can't go around the sun slower. Your numerical age is what it is, and that's stuff. But we have found that biological age can be metal here. Um, and through various lifestyle factors, um, through potentially uh, treatments or interventions, uh, we can actually change it. So it's estimated uh, that only about 10 to 30 percent of the, your biological aging is down to genetics. 
which is unbelievable if you think of the remainder as in your hands. It's the worst things you can do or smoke, eat an unhealthy lifestyle. But anyways, it's it's the fact that we know that it's pretty big. And then finally, what I'd say about uh, longevity is that it's really about prevention rather than firefighting. Um, and I'll go into this more here. Uh, let's say mainstream, it's a Trumpian word, mainstream healthcare treats diseases. Um, the way that longevity sees it is that the more physically unhealthy your body is in terms of aging, the more likely you are to get a chronic disease and die. The number one determinant of that is biological age. So what mainstream healthcare does is it treats the disease again. But what longevity science is saying is, hey, what if we kept your body healthier for longer? And if you do that, you delay getting the disease that's going to get you in the end. This is transformative. And when you look at these numbers, you can see why. Um, so it's estimated that about $3.5 trillion a year in the US alone is dedicated to combating chronic diseases, like cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes. Now, to put that number into perspective, I have a few stats here. Um, total US GDP is $19.4 trillion. So that's almost 20% of GDP dedicated to the fight against disease. Um, the International Space Station cost $150 billion. Uh, so we could have built 20 international space stations with the cost we'd save in one year of treating chronic disease. Um, US Department of Education is $70 billion a year. We could fund it for 50 years. And the World Food Program says that um, with $30 million a year, we can have um, So longevity is very exciting, as Phil is going to get into. Um, he's going to talk about the industry. He's going to talk about all of the exciting things that are happening in, in the industry. Um, what's also really exciting is how the world will change as a result. Um, because it's going to it's going to change. It. It's my belief that it's going to happen. It's going to take time. We're going to we're going to change the way we age. We already are through through this mindset approach. Um, but you know, people say, "Oh, what will we do if we live forever? How awful would that be?" Well, I mean, think of how we can reallocate our resources and our time if we can shift our health care system. Anyways, um, I'm going to skip through that because Phil's going to talk about what longevity is. And I am going to introduce Phil. Um, Phil is uh, one of the rare people in the space that have uh, an understanding of longevity from the science and the business side. Um, he runs the largest media um, organization and invest one of the largest investment sort of um, brokers in the state. So he has a really broad overview. We are so delighted to have him. Um, he has data that he's going to share with you and lots of proprietary data and anecdotal stories about what's happening on Jeffy. So if you want to know what's going on in the space, he's your guy. Um, but really quickly, I want to do a bunch of thank yous. Um, the amazing team at the Oxford Society of Aging and Longevity that I work with, um, who helped make this happen. Uh, Salmana, Emily, Simao, Shimon, Corby, and Lynn Cox, our academic advisor. Thank you so much. As I said, if you guys are interested in longevity, please go on our website, join the web mailing list, or get in touch with me. I'll put you in the right place. Um, thank you to SDS, to Karan, and all the awesome OBNs that helped make this happen. Thank you to Harry Robb and Bruno from Longevity Technology and our headline partner, who has just joined Netmine Life. Um, they are a super exciting startup that are working to empower people um, with healthy aging information and guidance. I highly recommend that you scan that QR code and try out their chatbot. It is very cool. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Phil, because he's more interesting than I am. So thank you for your time, guys. Hey, um, um, very nice definition. Uh, so there's a diagram that I 
He stopped using these little presentations, uh, but I thought it'd be good to dust it off pretty fast because it's interesting to use again. Uh, the top line is kind of the, the model that we're pursuing at the moment, um, where you get your first chronic disease. Obviously, you hope it's not going to be cancer, it's going to happen any time in your life. But diseases of age happen when you're in your sort of late 50s, early 60s, they start to come in. And of course, once they start kicking in, that's the end of your health span. But the, the model that we're focusing on uh, as an industry now is to really try and be in a position where you don't have any diseases at all in your life, diseases of aging specifically. And that really that compression of morbidity at the end of your life is not sort of 10 to 15 years that many of you in your families are going to be experiencing. You may have uh, grandparents that are in uh, care homes or parents that are starting to share science with dementia or whatever it may be. Uh, but of course, we don't want that. None of us want that as ourselves as individuals, but likewise for our, for our friends and family. And then as you can see, it's a little bit dark at the end there, because there's a little uh, arrow pointed backwards, because there are actually some people in this industry that are very focused on uh, uh, living forever. So Simon talked about, you know, there are people are talking about living forever, whether it's in the metaverse or whether it's in the physical world, who will know? Um, let me take you all back to 1967. Okay? So uh, this is me here, yeah. okay? And uh, there was a period of time when I did have hair in my And um, uh, 1967 actually is quite interesting. When you, when you put your date of birth in when you're on a mobile phone, it takes probably three or four scrolls to get to the year of your birth, which is pretty interesting. <laughs> um, so there's my, my sister on the end, Jo. Um, she's two years, two years older than me. Uh, she's been through the menopause. She's got the consequences of the menopause. There are people in our industry that are trying to give women the choice to not have the menopause, to, to extend their fertility, not necessarily to have children, but to avoid that estrogen driven bias. Then there's my dad, my lovely dad Jim. He died uh, eight years ago of dementia. Luna, she died of uh, cancer, so she's a different subject to today. My mum there, um, she doesn't look like that now. She's in her 80s, she's in the care home. Uh, Neville, my lovely uncle Neville, uh, he died in his 50s through cardiovascular disease. And then there's my, my cousin Andrew on the end there, but we don't talk about him because let's say every family's got one. So um, <laughs> uh, I thought I'd, I'd take a, uh, a picture of my of my supplements covered. Uh, I realised when I put a good slice together, there's actually a bottle of Angostura bitters in the top right hand corner. There, these are the hangover from, uh, from from Christmas. Um, but I have two shelves. I have the shelf above, which is the ones I'm not taking yet, and the shelf below, which is the ones that I am taking. And because of my position, you know, kind of in the industry, a lot of people want me to try out their, uh, their products and services. And uh, I was very tweaked uh, by an organization called BrainKey. And BrainKey do a, uh, uh, an AI-based uh, system where you take your, your, your head scans, you take the broad data from the scan, and then it tells you what your implications are for your, for your, uh, for your longevity, your brain health, your brain longevity. Now, of course, Dad's got dad had dementia, my mom's got dementia, so I'm very tuned into not having dementia and trying to avoid it as much as I can. Uh, so the good news is uh, that actually my brain is, uh, is, is uh, three years younger than me. So this is starting to touch into the point that Simon made, which is the difference between your, your chronological age and your metabolic age. And uh, interestingly, these are some of the results. Um, so I'm quite, quite proud of some of these. So uh, as you can see, uh, the brain's a bit bigger than the average brain. You know, that's, that's pretty good. Um, as you see, I'm, uh, my white mass is in a pretty good position as well, so that means that I'm okay on the dementia side of things. Uh, but the last one here is the uh, amygdala, which is actually uh, below below level. And uh, the guy that run the, run the, runs the company says, well, actually, that's because you've got not much empathy still. <laughs> 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 that's not good. I thought I was quite an empathetic person, but I was actually, actually somebody at a dinner who's actually one of our competitors in the industry, and I was explaining my results to her. She started being passive aggressive. So, quite a few things to tell you about it. So, All right, so um, 2018 was my entry point into the industry. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the industry and the trends of where it's going, but let's, let's talk about from a business perspective. I think it might be interesting to some of you that are uh, in business school, you know, what, what's, what are you doing in four years' time? So, um, I was doing a, a cycle ride, and uh, this is some images of cycle ride. The full claim, and I read the FT. I wrote this article about a company called Juvenescence and a guy called Jim Murphy. Hadn't heard of either of them, but you know, the headline sort of snaps for me. And, and, you know, we kind of get inspired by something, you read something, you kind of, your brain never goes, goes back and kind of, you know, that's pretty interesting. And I was actually, candidly, I was looking for something to throw myself into, really for the last part of my career, uh, to be really on the ground floor of a really new and exciting industry. A mega trend, as obviously I'm going to show for you. 
Um, so I went away and did some reading, and as you know, because some people know it will be great. Um, he's a real uh, fan and part of the industry, he had a few ups and downs over, uh, over the last few years, but he did a very similar paper in MIT. Uh, he updated that, but it's the old one. Uh, then there's a book called To Be a Machine, which was actually really quite uh, condescending about uh, some of the early pioneers in the industry, but also quite interesting to read. It was good to get you know, accounts, views, and everything. And then uh, George McKinnon is a big benefactor for, for the university here as well. His book, Juvenescence, and actually, the company is called Juvenescence that I read about, and his book is called Juvenescence, and he's uh, actually an investor in, in our business. So, I'll, right, I'm going in. You know, I'm going I'm to throw myself into, into my university. So, I had some, some capital put into uh, starting a business and uh, employing some, some people. So, this is literally a photograph of, the, uh, of the, one, of the, one of the team. And my as you can see here, and it's a website development for plans. Didn't have a website in those days, we are a website, and that, that was uh, uh, really the sort of uh, the, the really early stages. You can see here, we're trying to work out the personas of the people that we were trying to talk to. Who, who are we actually going to be building a product for? We're going to do a website, so great, you know, what are you going to talk about on that website? And you can see the top, top there is actually a wheel, it's an early graphic that I produced to try and identify what is the actual industry, what kind of the encompass the industry. So we started to, to do that. We, we ran in stealth mode. We actually tried to run a publication for six months without actually going live to really understand could we do it for enough information to flow and so on. So we launched in, in 2019, September 2019. And this is not us, this is the industry. So from an investment perspective, you can see that actually when I, when I joined the industry, it was uh, at three billion and um, it doubled to 2020 and 2021, uh, last year. Uh, was, um, was, was 7.8. So it's quite, uh, quite an interesting growth in the industry, and you're seeing the cost of development industry is still not big, but when it's actually moved from the uh, you know, is it possible to the point that it is possible. When things like new scientists are publishing like this, you start to get a feel for the fact that longevity is going to be in the mainstream. And you know, actually you know, exercise some of those things that's good for your, for your uh, good longevity. I was on my exercise bike this morning. And I was listening to Radio 4, as you do when you're in your 50s. And um, they were talking about um, doing, doing the paper reviews. And apparently, there's um, an article in the, Sun, in the Times today about uh, how to start mocking. Uh, yeah. So, so the, the, the message is starting to get out there. Um, a lot of you will know Jeff Bezos, obviously. And a lot of you will know that Alphoff Labs is a, uh, a new and exciting entrance into the industry. Uh, allegedly, it's not public, but he put $3 billion into, uh, uh, into, into Aptos. Uh, but a lot of people kind of, uh, I've been in many situations in my career, you know, when people say, oh, the internet's never going to take off. I mean, literally, people say, you know, music sounds crap on it, you know, it doesn't load fast enough. You know, but actually, look at it now. This is what's going to be happening in this industry. But it's not going to be for millionaires. And this is reflecting what um, Simon was saying, which is because it is a, it's a systemic, existential issue, not only for individuals, but also for governments. Uh, and this is just John Bell. He's, uh, He's a professor here at Oxford. Um, they love him on Radio 40. He's a real, real plain speaker. I don't know if you can read it there, but that's, that's his quote. You know, his view is that actually the NHS is screwed. And he, he actually, in the, in the article, he's talking about the fact that you know, putting more doctors and nurses into the NHS and just trying to service this tsunami of, of people um, is the equivalent of, of soldiers in the song, which is quite a graphic way of putting it. But you know, two lovely parents myself have been in many hospital corridors and seen all those people. In and out of a &E. it's it's as you said, it's, it's bloody awful. And the reality is, of course, it's hugely expensive. I mean, if you look here, this is the US, these are all the diseases of aging. You know, it's so it's three trillion a year that's being spent on it. And when you break it down, obviously you can see all of these individual diseases I mean, it's all the ones we recognize. And of course, this is the this is the macro of these. So of course, all, all of these behind all these data points is their individuals and individuals' families. What the trauma of the disease of AIDS and cause? And of course, you can miss it back to that first slide I showed. Well, you know, that's really great for me. So, um, defining longevity is one of those things that we really struggle with because I mean, I have to tell you, I mean, there are times I wonder whether I'm still nuts, but actually, we've kind of nailed it. Uh, you can see here that there is these uh, three elements to it, which we talk about. So, obviously, longevity determines which is the DNA we are born with. Um, then there are the aging drivers, which is really driven by not only your uh, uh, your metabolism but also your your lifestyle. 
or whatever it may be. And of course, then there's the alien diseases at the end, which will start to kick in the new Now, if you're into longevity, uh, you'll see some of these terms. You'll be, some of you will be very familiar with these terms, okay, mTOR and FOX over and so on. These are really the aging drivers. These are the things that underlie uh, the science that is being developed in the industry now, which is focused on mitigating those diseases of aging. And if you look at the way that healthcare uh, runs, I mean, I'm sure some of you in the audience today, maybe from medical school, you will have a specialist in one day. What happens at the moment is, is that uh, we treat one disease at a time. So, uh, and you can treat those diseases once you start to show the symptoms. Now, of course, we all know that things like bowel cancer and stuff like that, people are doing uh, diagnostics and uh, early testing, that's a great thing. But of course, they're still doing a point to point uh, program, they're still trying to understand. Whether someone's got bowel cancer or whether they've got prostate cancer. They're not looking at the exact system overall. So, really, what we're trying to do is get to the point where um, you're not fixing one disease at a time, you're looking at the whole disease. So, these aging drivers, if you, can, if you can work out these aging drivers, you're really in a position where you can start to mitigate those diseases systemically and holistically. So that you as an individual will have treatments in your, in your, in your, life, in your lifespan, which means that you don't get those diseases or you really reduce the opportunity of getting those diseases. So, you know, um, these slides are available, by the way, so I'm going to show a QR right at the end and you can download them and you're very welcome to But I, I love this statement, so I won't read it out for you. The point is that we are on something now as, as an industry. So we break the industry down into these kind of components, so think of it as a pyramid. So the, the next one is really how do you make, what do you do to, to work in, in between those three key things? So the first point is to prevention, to prevent things from happening uh, before they happen, and then renewal, which is in a position where you can either stop them happening earlier in your life, or maybe I think you can actually reverse them. And then, of course, if they do become seeds of aging, then you know, you're treating them. And of course, there's amazing technologies all the time, whether it's stem cells or whatever it may be, that are now being used to, to treat a disease. But you don't really want to be in a position where you're treating them, you're in a position where you're not having to reverse them. So that's where diagnostics comes in. I'm going to talk a lot about uh, metabolic age and um, it's a really important factor. So, um, current approach for cardiovascular disease, you can see here, you know, again, you've got prevention with uh, medications, you've got, you know, you've got probably a high going for ECG, you might get a pacemaker, if that doesn't work, then you're into angioplasty or you know, a number of things that I'm sure you're very familiar with. Whereas, you look at the longevity approach here, well, of course, it's the plastic diet, sleep, exercise, and so on, which I know is boring, but it's really important. Then, you know, diagnostics will come perhaps from your, your, your epigenetics, and we'll talk about that in more detail. And this is a company, I've highlighted a company, Cyclarity, and they're just about to come into the UK. They're a Silicon Valley-based uh, company. Uh, they're just about to go into phase one clinical trials, which means it's going from, uh, from lab, mice, going to humans. So they're going to be testing in humans for the first time, not to see if it works, but just to make sure that it's safe. And once it's safe, they'll move on. But it's quite interesting that they've come to the UK to do this because the UK government has actually uh, kind of deregulated the the approach. And uh, the fact that we've got the NHS and we've got sort of huge data points into the biobank and so on, this is sort of my better place to be actually uh, looking at uh, clinical trials. I see this is quite an interesting whether you want it or not, it's a Brexit dividend. And I think that the UK is going to become a very important part of the longevity pie. So uh, we break down the industry because we analyze the industry and I'm going to show you some of the data points from that. Uh, but these are the, the 25 components that we have that sit within the longevity industry. So some of these terms were you've never heard of if you're not from the scientific side, but you'll notice that there are things in here. There's not for example, there's not um climax, uh, there's not uh, care home technology. Uh, because once you're in a care home, we think that's really the end of the uh, end of the line for um, for longevity. But interestingly, there's some other things. So there's like, for example, uh, companion longevity, which we've updated that to, to pet longevity, because we really see the pets are going to be a very interesting uh, educator for the humans in terms of both the science as well as the acceptance of the fact that we are what's possible. So uh, bringing all of that together, this is how we now look at the industry. Um, so this is our Bible. We, we, we run our business now by the certain five pillars. And um, some of you might know George Church, who's a Harvard professor. Uh, we've worked with him, he's on our advisor panel, he's helped us uh, lock that down and, and finalize it. So, uh, moving into the business sphere, what does that actually 
actually look like? Well, in this, this is the last five years. Um, and you can see the, the investment that's gone in. So we have 4.3 billion into cellular programming. And cellular programming for instance, only just happened. And you see the moment how actually how very early stage and how very experimental it is. And you can see that there's some a very, very um, a long tail elements to the industry here. They may be in the long tail and much attracting much capital at the moment because they're very, very new. Uh, and I'll tell you what, there's one thing that really is on the inside of Phoenix because there's a whole layer of clinical awareness of longevity which just doesn't exist at the moment. And that's, a, that's going to be a limiting factor for the, uh, for the growth of the industry. So um, there are 10, 10 elements to this map as you can see here. So this is actually um, spread from NASA. NASA back in the 60s when they did the moon program had this thing called technology readiness level, TRL. So we started adopting TRLs as our, as our one to 10. And map that over the clinical pipelines. So we will talk a lot about phase one, phase two. So there's a lot of demarcations here. So in phase one, we go into humans. When you're on the left hand side, we are in very early discovery. And you can see how we can turn it over very different weights. And I've shown this there so in a short while. And this is the funding side. So you know, capital, you need capital, and a lot of capital uh, for some of these things. Again, um, these phase three trials, by the time you want to do phase three, into the market, you, you come up with a billion dollars for a therapeutic. So this is where big pharmaceutical companies are going to be. It's a very important component to the industry. So I mentioned cellular programming. This is conceptually really interesting. Uh, this is where uh, you have uh, work called pluripotent stem cells. It's a technique where you can take stem cells and you rewind it back to pluripotency, which means that it has got no identity. It's back to a completely embryonic state, and you can you can kind of reprogram that into into any one of those knee or whatever it may be, but of course it's a bit of a, bit of a blank uh, canvas. But when you look at uh, what this new technology is all about, it's winding uh, the age of cells back to the point where the cell still has its identity, it's still performing its, uh, its duties, whether it's a heart cell or uh, uh, a knee cell or whatever it may be, but uh, reprogramming is where all the capital goes. I mentioned Alex earlier, so you can see that the three billion in here, um, the phase three, so they're not in humans yet. And you can see that none of these none of these companies at the moment are in human. And you can see that they're really attracted to very big capital. So you know, two billion, you know, a big bridge between them and Bio, but actually there are some other companies like Calico, which some of you may know, uh, which is backed by the uh, the founders of Google, they, they've swallowed a lot of capital and nothing really has come out of it. So we're crazy what uh Alsos are going to do as a uh, as a as industry. Industry generation. So uh, regeneration at a cellular level, which is we can uh, regenerate cells, whether it's heart cells, there are some companies that are working on that. Uh, the concept is also to do it holistically, uh, regenerating the whole body. Um, but likewise, there are components in here as well. So you can see this is uh, an artificial heart. So you consider that really the, the concept of where you keep the engine going. And if you can get to the point where people talk about longevity, escape velocity, you're in a position where you manage to maintain yourself uh, as alive or as healthy as you possibly can be to the point where science catches up and then enables you to sort of stay, stay dead. But you can see again, a lot of companies now moving into, into clinical phases with, with, with the human, and again, you know, big capital going in there. But um, we talked to something I talked to you earlier with doing work in, in genetics. We see that um, uh, gene therapies coming from longevity are very interesting. There's a great parallel between gene therapies and their, their acceptance. Um, as well as what's happening now in the longevity sphere, because the gene therapies are much more mature, as you can see here. You can see, you can see, you can see some of them are in, in phase one trials. But the very interesting point from a business perspective, you can see now that they're getting acquired. So, this is a very interesting concept for when you are uh, a therapeutic, you're a, um, a deep biotech business, you're, you're funded. You know, it's going to cost you, you know, that, that billion to take that drug you develop all the way through to, uh, to the human. But actually, what you want to do is you want to build it sufficiently to the point where actually you dispose of it to, to M&A to, uh, to a big farmer. And then the big farmer will take it over and, and then bring, bring in the capital to take that drug of that, uh, that uh, system to market. And the interesting thing is because we're an investment brokerage house, we're also talking to uh, the venture arms of big pharmaceutical companies because they really are interested in so people say in the industry, sort of big, big pharma, they don't get it, just want to you know, compound their uh, income by fixing disease. That's not the case. Actually, they, they can see the opportunity that's happening here. 
So a couple of longer tail things. Um, pet longevity, 2022, it attracted um, 90 million in, in capital. But the interesting thing about um, pet longevity is that you're in a position where you've got a, let's call it a model organism, which is your dog, uh, who's going to live for 12 years, maybe 15 years tops. Um, so that means that you can be experimenting uh, on a much, much larger mammal, but actually share the same environment as us. And this, these aren't all the first things about these are dogs that are also running around but, uh, in fields and chasing balls and so on. You can see that there's some, there's some companies that are really starting to attract an interest in capital. And uh, the point really is, is that these, the education of these, of the industry, that actually food that it works in animals, but likewise educating people, because the possibility of what can happen as a, as a large mammal as we are uh, is very exciting. So um, this is a survey that we did on supplements. Now, a lot of investors are very interested in products that they can get to market quicker. There's not, not the five to 10 years of a uh, biotech development cycle, but actually something that can bring to market a lot quicker. And you can see here, these are the concerns. I hope you guys can read there. But you know, the biggest concern you can see really is um, uh, cognitive skills. Everybody's very concerned. One of the investors suffer at some point from a, a cognitive impairment. And it might progress obviously to the point where it becomes Alzheimer's. And there are, there are uh, uh, obviously, you know, um, companies that are working on that. But supplements are a very big industry at the moment. And these are some of the companies there that are doing that. Uh, Dr. Lane is a very interesting one because they've actually got clinical data uh, that demonstrates that when you take their, um, their uh, supplement, which is called the Dunes, on average, you will reduce your, your um, affinity gain of seven years. And the interesting thing is that actually, if you're if you're a vegan marathon runner, that's not the that's not the, the uh, supplement that you need to actually be overweight and actually ill because that's actually right. the, the focus for that technology is uh, is you know, the point with people that are in Florida rather than you know, people that are running in Norway. So the other point is that uh, diagnostics, as I mentioned before, is again really an interesting part of the industry. I'm going to share some stories with you about that. But the point is that there are not any industry standards at the moment. So this is a this is an issue that I feel we really need to be to get hold of. But again, they're attracting a lot of capital. So personalized supplementation is out there now as a, as a big industry where you get your um, uh, you know, your, your personalized supplements, and you can see again these companies are attracting some pretty big money. Okay. So um, let's talk about me for a little bit. Um, I'm 55. Um, but my, my ethnic gauge is 47. So I'm going to talk to you about that in a lot more detail in, in, a, in a while, but this concept of understanding the difference between your chronological age and your metabolic age is quite an interesting one. And the UK government has a uh, goal, one of these grand goals that they have, which is similar to the same, uh, same as the uh, sustainability goals that they have. Uh, they want to add, I think, 2035, into five years of healthy longevity for every UK system. And this is quite interesting because how are we going to work that out? Okay, there's lots of data that are probably very fair, but actually, I do really feel that once we've got a medical grade diagnostic, people are going to be looking at the, the difference between these two age points really as a marker for not only their own personal health, but also doctors looking at the UK laws. So, uh, in terms of capital raising, um, we can see here that. Uh, 2022 has been quite an interesting year for us. Uh, it's a slightly different chart than I showed you earlier. You can move M and A from that, um, but it's 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 been it's been in a down rank uh, over the over the last uh, 12 months. It's been pretty tough out there. If you buy a tech, you know it's very hard to get capital. And some people are aware of it, some people aren't. But it's been a bit like dot com crash in uh, buy a tech. Um, company formation is still be happening, as you can see. And for us, for us to remove ourselves from that last. Uh, Last year, of course, you can see it less than be over half of that is on Samsung's lap. So it's been an interesting time for us all. But when you look at cycles of things, uh, you can see here at the end, late stage VC is what was uh, 2021. So that's when three people were putting money into the last blushes of their dealers uh, before the uh, biotech uh, investment with, uh, happened. And you can see here that now the majority of money is going into early stage VC. So this is companies that are betting, betting on, on uh, small amounts. On, on earlier stage companies. And those are VCs, right? So again, if you, if you want to think about who's putting money into this, it is venture capital. Um, venture capital mixes patient capital with uh, expecting early returns on investment. 
And we're now seeing from an investment perspective, the industry is diverting into two. You've got biotech investors that are in for the long game, and you've got other investors who are putting money into longevity, knowing that they want to get a return on investment free. So this is where we see supplements, clinics, uh, service industry uh, activity in longevity really starting to pick up in terms of uh, investor apps. So um, I always like to look at the, the concept of this mega trend. We are on a mega trend. I think that uh, Simon put it very succinctly. You know, we won't actually feel it happen. I think it's going to happen over a very long period of time. Uh, but it's interesting to see what's happening when we lay over longevity over these other key industries. It's um, it's a much more percentage of those industries. Yeah, it's it's outtrended it so far. And actually, we've got new data that we're publishing shortly that demonstrates that demonstrates that even further. Um, and this is our report that we're going to be publishing next week. So it's on our website, which is on here. We're going to be going into great detail about all of the investment activity that's happening in this space. So I mentioned the difference between my chronological and my biological age. Uh, this is my, this is my, back to my sophie. And um, uh, when I came back with my test results, I said, yes, yes, I'm eight years younger than, uh, than I actually am. Her, her ask was, well, yes, that's typically for women. So I said, okay, well, like, why don't you do the test? She said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do the test. So, so she did the test as well. And um, this is the difference between the two and I. So when I did the test in April, I was 54.9 years old, but I came out at 47.5. Um, so if you did the same test, it would, it would take a few months before I did five. She actually came out at 65. Um, of course, we didn't get out there well, as you can imagine. So actually, there's 18, 18 years difference between us. And um, I have to say, I did a lot of conference presentations at the end of last year, and I did throw under the bus a bit because I did say that actually my wife's ethnicity old enough to be my mother. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, no longer the case uh, because I did a different test. Um, I did a different test um, with another gold standard uh, vendor. And you can see that uh, actually, when once I split me at 47.5, uh, they reran the numbers through the test and they actually put me in 56.3, which, which is actually older than I was at the time there. You can see they didn't do another test in the pre-metro time, parallel there. So, so the reality is, is that we're, we're, in, we're in an industry that is very early stage. There's capital that's going in that is adventurous capital. There are people, entrepreneurs coming into the industry that can see what's happening. Uh, but like any industry, whether it's whether it's fintech waiting for the banks to deregulate, whether it's internet things waiting for the organization in the industry to be able to set the standards or companies to be able to take uh, financial you know, structures for SIM cards that they normally would sell to, uh, to us, but actually for micro bits of uh, data for micro bits of income, we're in a long, long haul. And, and this industry is going to have to consolidate itself around a lot of different things, it's going to consolidate itself around um, standards. Um, as, as well as obviously the fact that uh, there's, uh, there's a long way to go. This is going to be a long haul of century. It's going to happen. But, um, you can see here, let's bring my, my chart a little bit messed up, but actually what we're building now is something that is, is actually a really new and interesting industry. You've seen from the, the data that I've shown you there that it's growing. Of course, it's, 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 it's receiving the issues that we've all got at the moment in terms of funding. Um, but the point is, is actually, I've been talking about data, I've been talking about finance, I've been talking about clinical techniques and so on, but the reality is it all comes down to us as individuals. So the way that we behave uh, ourselves obviously affects our own longevity. When you look at your family, you can see the way that families are now structured uh, in terms of what's happening with that, that um, morbidity period at the end of your life, which is really on farm. This is an industry that really needs to take off, and it is definitely going to. And I'm going to show you something that's going to be quite interesting for you. Just a minute. Uh, so, if anybody wants these slides, um, I'll leave that up there for, for just one minute, just so you can uh, you can get those. And um, uh, I'm going to just intro this a little bit because there's a uh, there's a movie coming up, there's a, a longevity movie coming up. There's been quite a few, um, and then some of them are a bit wacko, to be honest. But there's one that's coming out that's really really looking quite quite interesting. And I thought just to finish this off before we go into questions, is so I'll just show you the, uh, the trailer for it. You, and you'll see, hopefully, that a lot of this will make sense in terms of what I've been, uh, been talking about today. So, just to see if I can. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
I guess I would like to test for how far you take it in terms of being active and being over middle age. I'm the first generation on the planet that understands what makes us age. We could take an old cell and turn it back into a seemingly young cell. This future sci fi situation is very close to us. I mean, here I am in my 60s feeling better than ever. The majority of diseases are just due to the underlying aging process. It's an incredibly difficult on this field. Increasing the healthy lifespan of people around the world is the greatest benefit we can give to humanity. Things are going to be exponential. The more you dig into it, the more you see how real this actually is. And hopefully one of these things clicks. If FDA were to recognize aging as a disease, it's going to be a massive inflection point for all of us. I'm very excited. I think that aging can be cured a lot faster than most people are projecting. The prospect of living up to 200 years is really nothing. So don't do anything stupid to die today. We can't take advantage of the technology that are coming up in the future. And what we're saying there is that there was dogs are gone from all dogs to puppies again. Longevity is learning how to take away biochemical stress. What gives you a feeling of peace and what gives you a feeling of center? To me, aging is just being who you are, regardless of what the number is. A good diet and exercise will help you avoid heart disease, but it's truly not enough. Aging is a disease that we must treat like a disease, and there's many things that we can do now to slow that person's down. And then you not only live longer, but you live stronger. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw reversal of aging in every dimension. It's wild. If we can imagine it, we can make it happen. This shit works. Pretty cool, huh? Good. Well, okay. I think we're going to go into questions. So, thanks very much, everybody. Let's uh, let's get started. Let's on. All right. Bit over. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes. Oh, we're in some camera. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. All right, uh, questions. There is one over there. Let's we'll start here. <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much, Federica. Um, and I have a question to help you. Uh, I've had like 10 years of work experience in preventive health, and recently, uh, eight years back, I developed an online tool called Active Age, which compared me to actual age. and sort of stuff and uh, I've been pretty interested in biohacking and, uh, uh, and longevity. A great fan of Ben Greenfield. Um, so my question uh, actually is around the regulation bit of it. Uh, what uh, we realized during our work uh, was in India in private health insurance was there's some regulation pushback on uh, promoting rewards and incentives based on your uh, active age or Let's call it your biological age. And later on, uh, when we came to epigenetics, it's the same pushback. Uh, I, I understand that in the US, it might be a fairly evolved market. But I would like to understand how do you see regulation shaping up in terms of allowing people to get incentivized or penalized based their epigenetics and logic changes? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a company uh, in the US called Fortnite, which is just actually the first that's using epigenetic testing integration into the into the insurance company. And they're saying that the information is, uh, is completely online. So you, you as an individual will take an onboarding test and you will get your own personal plan, but nobody gets to see it from the company. Now, of course, the cynic in anybody would say, well, yeah, you're right, but actually there's going to be a point. And I'm sure there will be a point in the future where, a bit like Vitality, there's a UK insurer here, they get everybody a free Apple Watch. Yes, uh, Apple, Apple Watch. Watch. We did the same, it's called Multiply when I was in India. So I was like the product head for that. But we replicated, but the, well, there was a pushback on, you know, epigenetics and and incentivizing basically your vitality age, which we call active age there. So yeah, I think. Yeah. Well, the point the point is is that it's, it's probably going to happen. It's it's regulated, so it doesn't happen at the moment. But the very interesting thing about the industry is that it's a very international industry. So working on it into a country by country basis is going to be where. You're going to see things like uh, blockchain uh, coming into the industry where well, actually as digital citizens, we own our own data and we can port it anywhere we want to in the world. Because this is new from digital health, the issue of course is data transport. So where is the data held? Uh, where is that data transported? So for example, China's a 
huge growth industry. You can't get data in or out of China for, for regulatory reasons. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting one. And of course, as you know, medical devices are um, uh, actually need to be uh, classed as medical devices, so they need to go through an approval process. So we're already still in the industry now, still very vanilla. But because it's, as you can see, it's a lot of complex science, all the complex dimensions ultimately will be very individualized and be quite complex from a data management perspective. Good question. Uh, all right, over there. I'm a doctor and I've spent a lot of my life treating patients with an incurable disease with supplements that don't really do anything. Um, so I'm kind of a bit allergic to this type. And um, I couldn't see most of the things that were in your slide. The print was so small, the lighting was so awful. Um, but what I really was frustrated by was your wonderful supplement shelf. You didn't tell us anything about any of the things you're taking or why, or what the evidence is that they're going to help. So why can't you take, could you take us through some of those things? Uh, yeah, I can. I, 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 won't, I won't go into the whole list. The, the list is up there. And if you wanted to download the slides, you can see the detail in there. Um, there there's a lot of supplement form. A lot of supplement manufacturers now that are actually doing cl proper clinical outcome studies. And there's one in there, for example, called MitoQ, which I'm taking. I, I developed it for an effort. But this is not straight is that right? That's right. Well, then yes, I, 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 know, I know the person who put, put the drugs together for that very well. Oh, okay. And what she did was she said, because my patients, she won't treat the same kind of disease that I do, she said, because my patients all go to the health stores and they buy all these things, what I'm just going to do is I'm going to put all the ones that everybody buys into one tablet so they only have to pay once and uh, that's what that's how she did it it's yeah. not based on evidence no quite a big tablet I imagine, yeah, yeah. as well so so i mean i i, I have i have personal my supplement but i i took from one organization i took a blood test uh the saliva test and a, and a gut biome test and then i got a very very highly profiled individual program for for my supplements now it's run by doctors it's you know, it's, it's an early move in the industry. Of course, it will need to be, you know, uh, developed into a much wider industry. But I, I think that that's something that really demonstrates that organisations are taking it much more seriously. So, you know, I've got my standardised supplementation, but I also do take some extras that I. So I have what's called a, a NAT Plus booster. So I take NMN, uh, which is um, perfectly available um, from the band that I'm going to go to, and I, I take MitoQ, which is the one that I, that I mentioned earlier, which is help uh, open up a lot of broad pathways as well as help with the cellular health. So those are the ones I take. I actually have a counter question because um, I think what you're touching on is really fascinating. Is you have a generation of people that are taking a lot of agency with their personal health, um, which is maybe not the case you know, a decade or two decades ago. People have the internet um, and they can choose to find information, whether it's correct or incorrect. Now it's a double-edged sword. Um, obviously, we want people to be empowered and enlightened. Um, and our health system can't take care of everyone. We don't have enough doctors to give the advice that we need. So I guess my question too is like, and longevity biohacking sort of it can fall into those categories of people that are seeking out um, that are seeking out their own health, but then maybe sometimes disappointed or annoyed at the fact that you know they look at depression medication, which where's the evidence for that for many people? They can't just take a pill and it goes away, even though Dr. Summit. So my question to you is like, what do you think about this new wave of individual empowerment for personal health? And how do you, as a clinician, how do you kind of handle that? I have a quite a problem with it. I mean, actually, to be fair, my son runs a supplements business. Uh, <laughs> I, I see. have to admit, I, I've never advised him on any of the things that he stops. Um, I went to a talk on Alzheimer's was convinced that Vitamin B3 sounded like it might be a good thing to do to have. So I started, I actually bought some, I've got to, I've got to give me some. So I did take vitamin B3 for a bit, but I'm now stopped. Now, so, well, should we be, it should, should be, and I think the issue about people self medicating is a real problem. I have, I have a friend whose mother decided that blue green algae was for a whole barat, was going to be the answer to her health problems, and she took it for about 40 years. And she developed a severe neurodegenerative disease. And actually, when I came to do Google search on it, I think it's due to the Holland Barrett supplement. So I'm quite scared about these things. 
because I just think that that vitamin B3, the reason I stopped taking it, is I then thought, well, actually, physiologically, you don't know what happens if I, I'm actually increasing my levels three or four fold above the normal. You know, we don't know whether that's actually beneficial or not. So I actually, I hate self-medication, actually. Yeah. I, think it's, I, think it's, I think it's a real problem. Well, I, think I it's actually too. think it should be doing I think exercise, and I think taking, uh, eating foods that are not processed, because the actual nutritional data uh, is out there. That's the only thing. Well, thank you. That was, it's, a really, it's a really big question. Thank you for that. Uh, next question. Uh, over there, and then we'll come down here. Uh, sorry, in the burgundy, yes. Hi. So um, I'm intrigued by the investment landscape because a lot of money is going into the very early stage of discovery of stuff where there's no proof of concept that any of it works. And the things that we know from the literature from decades of really solid research, um, repurposed drugs, rapamycin, potentially metformin, statins, bisphosphonates, they all look incredibly promising, but there's no funding because of our patent. How do we cope with this idea that we already have therapeutics, that some of them, we've got a tiny clinical trial of rapamycin, now there's another one in the States. Um, how do we get the funding in for things that people aren't going to make profit from because they're not IP? Yeah, so, so I think what's happening now, and we, we see these cycles because we deal with investors and companies all the time, Especially with the advent of what's happened in buyers and investors. Investors and startups are now looking at the fact that there's a proven safety trial that purpose in the proof of safety that can actually be hacked to then develop a proof of that. So we're seeing, as you mentioned, rapamycin, metformin, uh, they are actually becoming comics uh, appealing to investors all the time. So we're seeing a couple of companies that are in our portfolio that are, that are doing that at this stage. And there's also a lot of uh, organizations that are looking at old clinical data. So they're mining old clinical outcome studies to understand if there's actually in patient populations, if there's efficacy in there. So AI is really becoming a very important um, drug discovery platform. And uh, to answer your question, yeah, there's a lot of existing compounds that are proven to be safe uh, in, that, in, that, um, in that marketplace. So yeah, and I, I, you know, I, I can't disclose some of them, but I, I speak to some very interesting people and many of them you'll know uh, who are coming to me now saying, I've got this, I've got this, we've got a, a, our AI and it's just come up with the, the discovery that this, this existing compound is the one that's going to be used for longevity efficacy. So it's a very interesting time in the industry. And, and I, I think there are, I think part of the answer to your question is that um, probably people haven't thought of how to monetize those properly. There are examples of companies that have successfully marketed uh, off patent drugs. So, for example, Hymns for hair loss, which took um, two existing compounds, minoxidil and finasteride, uh, and just marketed better, and you know made a company um, out of something that already existed. So I think in the future there's going to be a lot of innovation and discovery around. Okay, once we actually do get the data behind metformin and rapamycin, and the consumer is ready, um, I think the, the ecosystem will mature and offer a solution to people, which will draw investment. So I think that will happen. All right, questions? Um, uh, so related to um, the comment about the blue green algae, how do you know that the stabilizers in the supplement effect of the, the active ingredient? Well, I, I had a very interesting uh, example of that. So, so my supplement covers used to be just the result of great marketing, right? So <laughs> it, there, yeah, whether it's such and such that i my friend swears by this, you know, then you just fill it up and you kind of just keep on. And the number of supplements that I was paying for is pretty crazy. So I had this test, um, and uh, it was quercetin, was actually one of those that I was taking. And the doctor said, don't take that because that seems to be contraindicative to the work that you're doing with your exist with the prescriptions that I've been giving you in certain supplements. So it's, it's a very valid point, and people are. Yeah. Over self medicating, so yeah. there, there's no science behind it. So, you do need to be in a position really where somebody that's, and I may have heard, I mentioned earlier, there's a whole missing layer in the industry, which is the clinical layer. So, there are existing clinicians and nutritionists and so on that are now starting to go through longevity courses, albeit very, very early stage, who are then in a position where they can start to understand what they're trying to do from a longevity perspective, but with their, with their training background. Um, um, additional question to that. Do you think we could get like longevity as a specialism in medicine 
as a result. Yeah, well, there's, there's, I'm really excited to learn this. Uh, Shiva University Hospital in Israel, which is a state, state funded, um, it's called a, a national, national infrastructure hospital, has now got a, a longevity department. Uh, and everyday citizens can go in there, they can have their tests done, they'll come out there with their with their uh, epigenetic scoring and then they'll be given a life program to, to help them. So that's really happening right now. Early stage, but it's happening. Great questions. All right, two more questions. Uh, over here. Yeah, so while we wait for all these amazing technologies of the future, uh, what do you think are the main, like the most impactful things we can do with what's available to us now? Can I do a shameless plug for the society? We've got some events coming up to cover that. Um, so we have uh, we have our next event on what you can do today if you want to sleep. That's going to happen later in the year. I can't announce who the speaker is, but it's going to be a truly remarkable figure, leading scientists in the sleep health space. We're going to have another on on exercise and nutrition. So come to those events, and we'll be able to give you all the tips on what you can do today in terms of behavior change and the choices you make to have a healthy lifestyle and age uh, healthy. Uh, last question. Um, over there in the back of the navy sweater. No, nope, you're, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm also a physician. I'm super on board with thinking about health span and how we can prolong it. I think one of the things that's been a highlight of this lecture is that so much of this does come down to individual behavior change and the things that we do do in our daily lives. And so I'm really wondering if there's anything super exciting happening that is getting investment or getting attention in the space of behavior change because habit ass and having a Peloton in your house and knowing that a Mediterranean diet and sleep is good doesn't change a lot of people's behavior. And it's such a hard problem for family medicine physicians to solve because they just can't get their patients to do the things that they know are good for them. Yeah, so I, I, should, I should say that you know, the, the case of the end of two between my wife and I yeah. had a very interesting one <laughs> because she thinks I'm crazy with the things that I do, the amount of supplements that I take and that I get up and exercise and all those types of things. Um, she took that test and it was a bit of a, a crap moment for her. So I, I do genuinely feel that once the industry has confidence in the metabolic versus chronological age arguments, that, that would become the thing of dinner parties, right? So it would be, how old are you kind of questions, but actually people want to brag with the fact that they're younger than their, their, uh, their metabolic age. But like I said, they're older than their metabolic age, that's a wake up call. And I do genuinely think that that, with all the other nice factors that can come through absent behavioral change, it, it's really starting to happen. And you can see it, can't you, in, in overall, from a, from a national perspective, the apps, the, uh, the um, services that are out there is becoming much more prevalent in people's lives. And just one thing I'll say on behavior change. <clears throat> behavior change is tough. Really tough. Um, and, you know, it's very easy for me to sit here and tell you, hey, you've got to exercise six times a week. You've got to eat like this. And you've got to do that and do that. Very easy to give advice. And as a clinician, you're like, oh, well, you know, we know that. But from the personal standpoint, it's tough. I crack. I sometimes don't eat properly. I've been on a war on carbs for like, you know, a year now. And just keep people in this row, you know, because it's going well. So, you know, I'm a fan of behavior change. Um, and I think that there's some, there's some excellent examples of, of longevity companies like Humanity, for example, um, that have apps that you can sort of gamify the behavior change component that are super exciting. Um, but I, I think that we have to be realistic about how people behave. People just want to take a pill. And as much as we know that the best thing to do is behavior change, if you know, we have to also accept that people are going to be people. And so I think there needs to be a bit of gentleness and understanding of what it's really like to be human. So that's what I'd say on behavior change. Yeah, alcohol is tough. And if you enjoy a drink, really you shouldn't be enjoying a drink. So it's you know, diets, exercise, sleep, and alcohol in the four pillars. Uh, yeah, apps can help you with that, but it does come down to whether you're inclined to want to do it or not. And I think that my wife, that's uh, around two, definitely changed her behavior on the way. Something real nice. Got a little bit of work to do. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and also, obviously, information. Information is power. Um, so, learning more about these subjects, coming to these events, um, learning about the science of sleep, like, that's a great way of changing behavior from the inside out. So you guys are already on a good track. The fact that you're at this event, 
you're part of like the 0.01% of society that's probably really actively engaged in settlement. So you guys are. All right, so just uh, because of time, I'm going to stop here. Um, thank you guys so much. We've got a drinks reception outside with, I think, some pizza, um, which I hope is <laughs> nice. <laughs> I know. This is the funny thing about <laughs> 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 So we've got pizza and drinks outside.